Um, it's five o'clock and I think maybe we should make a start. We're expecting Liam Byrne to be joining us. He is the um, chair of the uh, Select Committee on uh, Business and Trade. Uh, my name is Yasmin Qureshi and I'm the Member of Parliament for Bolton, South and Walkden, first elected in 2010. It's a pleasure to be invited here by the SME Labour to chair today's session. But firstly, I want to begin to say how wonderful it was yesterday that for the first time in 14 years, we had a Labour <coughs> Chancellor address the conference. And while it's clear that the challenges facing our country cannot be underestimated, but I am confident for the first time in a long time that investors are looking at Britain and saying this is a country with a stable government and one that has a clear plan. As you will know, part of the plan is the establishment of the National Wealth Fund, which will soon be established formally in the UK law, making it a permanent institution at the heart of the country's long-term growth and prosperity plan. While the finer details of who will head NWF and how it might look in practice are yet to be set out, it is an exciting prospect that will attract private investment into the UK infrastructure. I'm really pleased that today we've got a very distinguished panel of speakers who will be discussing all this um, in detail. But before we uh, go into the sort of formal part of it, I like my, my colleagues to speak, I would like to warmly welcome the Qantari Ambassador, Sheikh Abdullah bin Mohammed bin Saad Al Thani, who is the sponsor of this event. Thank you, Ambassador, and welcome. Thank you. Over to you. First of all, you know, thank you so much for coming in, coming in here and uh, uh, looking uh, forward to hear from you. Uh, I was supposed to be here uh, today, full day, and uh, you know, uh, leave tomorrow. But unfortunately, for some, uh, you know, uh, appointments, important, uh, you know, appointments for tomorrow, uh, I shall be leaving early. But uh, if I did not answer most of the question, my Friend uh, Al Kuwari here, uh, he's gonna uh, take the rest. But uh, I'll be here, uh, you know, staying with you as m as much as I could. Uh, look, I, I heard about the uh, you know uh, National Wealth Fund that uh, the UK is really in preparation of uh, uh, you know adopting or or creating. And if I have. Uh, I will start shortly and then I will give everyone the floor and then we, I will take uh, more question and answer. But if I were you, I would first of all set the uh, strategy of such a fund. Because uh, if you look around you, you will see that there is a wealth fund that it is for stability of the economy. Others are for growth of a, uh, an economy. Others will say it is for a future uh, generation and uh, future uh, wealth. Uh, if I talk about the uh, organization that uh, I proudly headed for four years, uh, our main target is really to invest the excess of any uh, uh, of the oil and gas return and put, put it in the uh, uh, wealth fund for the future generations so that they can live the same s uh, lifestyle that we enjoyed uh, you know, uh, in our days. So uh, with that in, in, in mind, I would like, you know, again, to leave the floor for my friends to uh, give an introduction. But, uh, you know, I would like to address uh, sectors, uh, where to invest, and what are the, um, you know, uh, opportunities that we should look for, what are the ge geographic area that we should really, uh, you know, invest in. With, with that in, you know, in, on the floor, I believe, you know, I'm setting the floor for you to have some questions and ready and I will be more than happy to, uh, to answer. But I'm not going to take the floor away from my friends here. Well, thank you, Ambassador, for that. Uh, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to call uh, my colleague, Dr. Jeevan Sandu, who sits to my left, the Member of Parliament for Loughborough. He was elected this year, but I know he's got a massive background in finance and economics. So perhaps you could share with yeah. us some... Uh, good, good evening. Good evening. Everyone's looking very fresh on what is the fourth day of conference. Lots of early nights last night I can see in the audience today. Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to be as part of a Labour government, of course. Quite a buzz given the fact we just had a speech by a Labour Prime Minister at conference that hasn't happened in my adult life. So it's great to be here. 
And more broadly, look, I am I am now an MP, a Member of Parliament. I used to be, though, an economist. I was the head of economics at the New Economics Foundation. Before that, I worked in the Treasury and in Somaliland. And what I would say is that what the National Wealth Fund is really about, or indeed constitute a part of, is the UK's newfound industrial strategy. And what we see is that nations do well in their industrial strategy across the world is when they aim to transform <coughs> its structure. And what they aim to do by doing so is not just about the finance, which I know is obviously a key part of the National Wealth Fund, but also skills, supporting investments, and beyond that, a direction of travel that's clear for other nations to get towards and indeed go to. Uh, when we look abroad at the moment, we are seeing one nation embody this kind of investment, indeed, from their own sovereign capabilities, and that is, of course, the United States that is creating sectors locally in their nation and leading to growing prosperity there. And so what we're seeing inside the United States, not only those sectors starting to power ahead, not only it crowding in far more primary sector investment than they were expecting. So the US at the moment, the Clean Energy Act, about five pounds of, five dollars rather, of private investment for every dollar. And it's really powering ahead and seeing that nation grow. But more than that as well, is creating jobs and prosperity in areas that used to not have it. And that indeed is part of the UK government's new National Wealth Fund. This is entirely about investing in our infrastructure and those other kind of technologies that will allow us to make the green transition. And in particular, I want to create or rather focus on one particular part of that, which is hydrogen, uh, partly because I am the MP for Loughborough and hydrogen is a key sector for Loughborough. We have seen £500 million that has been committed to as part of the National Wealth Fund. And in the in the main, the same the main thing about hydrogen is this: hydrogen is key for us to get to net zero. When we think about net zero, we often think naturally of clean energy. We think about decarbonising our cars. We think about insulating our homes. What is less clear is that actually, in order to grow food, we need to have ammonia. You need to have ammonia. You need to have hydrogen. You need to go hydrogen. You have to produce that hydrogen. Now, at the moment, that hydrogen tends to be produced using fossil fuels. Now, across the globe, we need ammonia to feed us. So one nation is going to lead the way in producing green hydrogen. I want that nation to be the UK, and I want that town to be Loughborough, and I want you all to come to Loughborough. Yes, to knock on doors, but also to bring some money <laughs> and deliver leaflets and do all the rest of it. But the main thing I want to see is that grow locally. And the point about that is that when you have that investment come locally from the National Wealth Fund, leveraging in private sector investment, that means more jobs and more wages, yes, in my constituency, but also for us to export across the globe. And what is true for hydrogen will also be true for other investments that are made in and through the National Wealth Fund, of course, and alongside the infrastructure and skills. The other two things I wanted to touch upon today are really, really important. One of which is around supply chain security, and indeed the National Wealth Fund will be talking and indeed examining this issue. It's clear we are in a more vulnerable and difficult time, indeed the most dangerous for our nation since the Second World War. What is needed at that moment is for economic policy to provide and indeed have a direction, and that is something this government is keen to do, and indeed the National Wealth Fund is a part of that. And finally, in levelling up more broadly, this is a tool or one of the tools that we will aim to achieve and indeed see levelling up. The National Wealth Fund, I think, more broadly is this. It is an investment in our infrastructure, in our green technologies, in our future. It does end up leveraging with the private sector. And yes, this is a government that will work with the private sector to create prosperity. It is not for us in government to do this alone. It is also, we know that business needs a partner, but so too do our education institutions. This is part of a structure and indeed a direction of government of industrial policy that we have not seen for a very long time, arguably ever. This is no longer about the 70s and picking winners. This is about transforming markets and indeed transforming our nation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, even we can see why you won the election with that very persuasive skill about wanting funding and things, investment in your constituency. Uh, I'd like to now welcome Fahed Ali Al Khwari, Senior Manager Investor Relations in West Qatar, to talk about because you have got a phenomenal um, wealth fund. So, so um, tell us about that. Yeah, it's uh, thank you for that. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here. I manage the investor relations sector of Invest Qatar, which is a, an organization very recently created to attract foreign direct investment. 
One of the ways we do that is we work very closely with our sovereign wealth fund in order to grant mostly equity-free investments into projects that create win-wins. Um, there are a lot of themes that I heard on the panel. Um, hydrogen is a big one, sector creation, that I, I'm looking forward to explore further during this conversation. Would, well, I can, I, if you you'd like, I can... talk about yeah, some of the challenges. Sure, and, you know, yeah. Um, to, so we, we, we are... Can do to definitely, yeah. We are, we are around three years old. The reason for our existence, the context behind it, is that we spent most of our modern history investing abroad, so utilizing the returns from that, uh, as well as the returns from our hydrocarbon sectors and our financial sectors. And what this does is it helps us diversify the economy through foreign direct investment. There's uh, a little context that you should know. In the, in the lead up to the World Cup, Qatar spent a lot of money building infrastructure. Today we have an infrastructure that can house around 5 million people with a population of around 2.6. So we could double in size tomorrow um, and, and be ready for it. But we would like to do that sustainably. We would like to do that responsibly. And the way to do that is through talent, we believe. Um, we're, we're generally not uh, focused on capex investments, we're more focused on talent, and the best way to attract it is bright minds that contribute to the economy through business. Um, that's primarily our, our mission statement. Um, the way we work with the Sovereign Wealth Fund is such that, one, we, we help all the companies in which QIA has a, a position to, to find opportunity not only in Qatar but in the region. Um, and the other thing we do is that we have uh, an investment arm that incentivizes projects in country. We've done this a few times with uh, UK-based companies, um, and they found Qatar quite lucrative because they utilized uh, a lot of infrastructure in terms of joint agreements and international trade agreements that range from free trade agreements to double taxation and others. One of them is actually a medical company that uh, in our free zones fills their syringes in Qatar and then re-exports them back to the UK for distribution in the EU because they found that our free trade agreements help their bottom line after the UK uh, left the EU, and so um, we have a lot of very niche areas in which we can help companies grow. Um, and we do that not only through market access, but also through capital. The only thing that we ask in return is that any activity that's value adding is, is done in-house in Qatar. The things that we shy away from, I think that's very important to mention as well, uh, just because of the same context that I mentioned earlier, are um, uh, businesses that are very heavy in pollution, so you know we, we've rejected in the past pipeline coating companies. These these companies usually, they're going to need six to seven hundred employees. None of them very highly skilled. Um, it's a very highly polluting uh, activity. It takes up a lot of land, something that Qatar does not have much of. And but even though it made sense for our oil and gas industry, we figured that the the spillover effect, the negative spillover effects, didn't make sense for us. So so that's one of these things that are that's very capex heavy that most countries would would welcome that uh, we figured this is, is not for us. Again, we're after the talent. We're very happy to facilitate um, any sort of movement that comes in. All of our investments that come from Invest Qatar are equity free um, because our goal is the stakeholders here are, are not me. It's, it's generally my children and, and then hopefully their children. Um, in a nutshell, that's, that's who we are and I look forward to discussing this more. Thank you so much for that, thank you. And now I'd like to ask um, Alan Gamal, who is the private parliamentary secretary to David Lemmy, our foreign secretary. It's a lot of words. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of words. But very important words. So, uh, the PPS to David Lemmy, our foreign secretary. Alan, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Ambassador, uh, for this event and for your continued investment in our, in our country. Sadly, I can't say, like Jeevan, that this is the first time I've heard a Labour Prime Minister speak in my adult life, so that's a generational uh, uh, hit. Uh, <laughs> Only at the start of the evening. Um, uh, I was a British diplomat. I was the UK's trade commissioner in South Asia before this job. And I am so proud now to be in a government that's serious about long-term relationships uh, around the world and serious about uh, attracting investment and serious about an industrial strategy. Um, wh what we heard today from the Prime Minister wasn't just uh, about growth and wealth creation. He also mentioned the importance of, of this sector of small and medium businesses to the growth of our uh, economy. Um, and, uh, and he also talked about practical solutions. And, I, and, and when I was thinking about the most exciting things I did 
uh, as the Trade Commissioner, it was, it was getting those small and medium businesses who had a really brilliant solution but hadn't yet exported to India uh, into, into that market. So, so if, if that is why you're here, you're absolutely critical to the medium and long-term ambitions we have for this country. Uh, uh, and if you can uh, continue to do that, please, please do so. And if you can do it in Irvine, that's even better. Um, uh, the, 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 the other thing that I, I saw that was uh, really important in, in attracting international investment and really was hampering us when I was Trade Commissioner was just the lack of predictability and stability in our government for the last few years. Um, and what we now have with uh, such an impressive Labour majority is that predictability and stability that investors, international investors, are looking for and an ambitious vision for our country and that's where this National uh, Wealth Fund comes from. Uh, and in my last uh, uh, weeks and months in India, I was very happy to talk to people about the likely change that was going to come to our country. Uh, I was also very happy to secure a four and a half billion pounds investment by Tata in a gigafactory in the southwest uh, of England. Um, uh, I think heralding the fact that investors were already pricing in there was going to be a change to the UK and one that they could have confidence in. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here and to learn more from people in the room about what you need a fund to look like and also what you need our government to be doing to make sure your businesses can succeed. Thank you so much for that, David. And now, last but not least, I'd like to introduce Liam Byrne, who's the Member of Parliament for Hodge Hill, who was a Treasury Minister, and more specifically, he's been re-elected as the Chair of the Biz Select Committee. I think that's the government department that I'm sure is going to be hopefully leading on a lot of these issues. And perhaps you can share with us some well, of your well, thoughts. Well, let, um, thank you so much for that, Yasmin. It's a real pleasure to join you tonight. And um, thank you so much for being here. And uh, a huge congratulations actually to SMEs for Labour uh, for helping bring us together. It's an extraordinary organisation um, that many of us in the Labour Party um, work very closely with um, and is just really important in helping us structure many such conversations like this. So um, I'm not going to talk for very long. I'm just going to talk for a couple of minutes. Um, Parliament is full of politicians who talk for too long. Um, <laughs> I've, I have friends I've not talked to for days because I didn't want to interrupt them. Um, so the book length, I should say, the, the, the book length version of what I'm about to say is available in Waterstones, uh, the inequality of wealth. So, so that's great. Um, and there is a chapter on exactly this topic because how we build a UK sovereign wealth fund is a key part of how we fix the inequality of wealth that scars our country. And there are just sort of three notes I wanted to strike. So one is about the lesson of history. Uh, my apologies if this has already been covered. But once upon a time, we had this extraordinary natural resources windfall in this country. It's called North Sea Oil. Uh, and if we'd done what the canny Norwegians had done and put the proceeds into a sovereign wealth fund, that fund would be worth 500 billion pounds today. Now, sadly, we didn't do what the canny Norwegians did. We let the resource go. But look, let's not repeat the mistake. Let's learn from that lesson of history and actually think forensically, not just about how we create a sovereign wealth fund here in the UK, but how we grow it. Now, as you will know, if you're building a sovereign wealth fund, you've got three big decisions to take. Where is the money going to come from? What are you going to put the money into? And what are you going to do with the dividends? And you'll have seen and you'll have heard about the size of the sovereign wealth fund that's put UK, national wealth fund that's been proposed to the UK. It's actually quite small. And there are actually big opportunities for us to grow it by bringing together the wide range of assets which are in all sorts of parts of government. And one of my jobs as Chief Secretary of the Treasury under Gordon Brown was to try and sell a lot of this stuff. Um, and I made the officials go through the books to find out all the crazy things that we happen to own. Um, my favorite was the government wine cellar. So below Lancaster House is about 23 and a half million pounds worth of wine. Um, some of it goes back to about 1876. It's actually labeled in the register. It says, drink sparingly. <laughs> but 
those investments have actually multiplied during COVID because we invested in all kinds of things. We invested in um, football clubs. Uh, the strangest investment is an investment in an international party organising uh, business which organises international sex parties called Killing Kittens. Literally, the British taxpayer owns shares in this organisation. So my point is that across the UK, across the, the public balance sheet, there's all kinds of weird stuff. That includes the Crown Estate, which of course owns the seabeds and the riverbeds out to the, um, the legal limit. Um, but by bringing many of these assets together, we would radically change the size of the balance sheet in the UK Sovereign Wealth Fund. If we then started recycling capital taxes into it, Within about four or five years, you could build a fund of about £200 billion. That then gives you some really serious opportunities for co-investors to come in. And not only does that help us transform the investment rate, as you've heard so eloquently about tonight, it also creates some pretty significant dividends. In fact, if you look at, about, if you look at the, the global average of returns on sovereign wealth funds, about 80 sovereign wealth funds now around the world, the average rate of return is about 8%. Now, if you reinvest 4%, just to sort of maintain the size of the fund, and distribute 4% each year to, say, every 25-year-old, that is enough to give every 25-year-old in the country £10,000 in dividends, which is, of course, the average shortfall on the deposit to buy a house. So there are kind of ways in which we can build sovereign wealth funds, uh, not only to transform the investment rate, not only to rationalise some of the weirder investments that we already happen to own, um, but crucially, to actually recycle wealth to the next generation. And if, as Keir Starmer said today, we want to drive hard behind wealth creation, then making sure that we are helping the next generation build wealth fast um, is incredibly important. Now, you know, we are novices at this in the UK. We are behind the learning curve that many of you who have already sailed down. And so that's why conversations like this tonight are just so important, because once you build these things, there's a million and one questions. I loved your examples about um, what you did not and did invest in. You know, if you've got a sovereign wealth fund, actually, that is a yeah. public policy question that the public actually care about. Um, are you investing in vice, or are you investing in virtue? That very quickly becomes a topic, becomes our uh, Prime Minister's question. So we've got a terrific amount of, to learn from uh, the people in the room tonight, and that is just why I'm so grateful to SMEs for Labour for bringing together to have this conversation tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for that. Uh, before I open up to questions, by way of background information, the uh, National Wealth Fund, the government has pledged to... Uh, 7.3 billion in funding to it to attract private investment. And its aim is to look at the growth of the economy in sectors such as uh, port, manufacturing, renewable energy, green steel, hydrogen, industrial decarbonisation, and gigafactories. And the goal is that it will aim to catalyse private uh, sector investment in new and growing industries and provide state funding for these projects. So that's the background behind it and the sort of amount that the government is looking to invest in it. Um, so I just wanted to um, ask firstly if anybody's got any questions. Excellent. I saw that hand first, then the gentleman. Oh, hello, thank you. Uh, my name's Dan. I work for an SME, but we have uh, clients across Europe and in India and in the Asia, Asia Pacific region. Uh, who are very, very large companies indeed. And uh, they know I'm a Labour Party activist because I took the polling week off. Uh, <laughs> so they have asked me, uh, oh, you have this great new thing called the National Wealth Fund. How do we invest our many hundreds of billions of dollars in this National Wealth Fund? So I said, I'll go to the Labour Party conference and ask. And so here I am. Um, how is the interface between investors and the Wealth Fund going to work? What will that look like? And, uh, and how can we attract clients of mine and clients of everybody into this room to achieve what uh, has been achieved in Qatar with the 5 to 1 ratio of investment? Thank you very much. I'll take, the, I'll take about three questions in one go and then we'll come to the next set of questions. The gentleman there and then afterwards the gentleman there. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Javan, for reminding us uh, about Labour. Uh, don't forget, we came to 
you love borrow and doing your bracelet. Yes, thank you. You haven't done your own, but we are came together. Um, my question is uh, from uh, Honorable Ambassador, or uh, the manager. It's, it's very interesting to see that Qatar is investing a lot in Britain, and now, I mean, Qatar is also inviting investors from all over the world, and which is fine. There's mutual investment, the global, that's of how it works. Uh, but in Britain now, we are, I'm, I'm a councillor from London Borough of Leesham, so a lot of investment funds, like we manage, I'm a member of pension investment fund also. So we are more uh, like shifting toward all investment, like more, we call it ethical investment. I'm not talking about uh, killing kitten, but. Right. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so that is absolutely fine. I think, that's, legacy. I think, I think that, is, uh, that is in South London, actually. <laughs> that's coming. Right. That investment is coming to our <laughs> side, so I'm fine with MSI to have that investment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we are uh, moving toward uh, uh, non fossil fuel investments. So what opportunities do you offer to international people who, um, companies who would like to invest in a non-fossil fuel, like a green investment? Thank you. Thank you. And the gentleman there, and then the gentleman. Thank you. My name is uh, Tenwaya Khan. I am a councillor in London Borough of Redbridge, where I'm also the chair of the Pension Fund Committee, and I'm also an economist by profession. Uh, I must uh, say I was so excited by this event that I ended up here yesterday at 5 o'clock. Yeah, true. But I mean, that was also a good event by SME for Labour about the Middle East, so I stuck around for that. But last week in uh, Birmingham, uh, Liam, there was the Local Government Pension Fund Summit, and I actually passed by your office while oh, I was there. Uh, I asked the question, what would a 28 billion or a 29 billion that we've heard uh, fund have impact? Or what impact can it have? And I think you answered the question by saying we can multiply it with other things. So that aside, my question to the panel would be, with the UK's national fund primarily relying on private capital, uh, unlike the state-funded wealth, the sovereign wealth funds like Qatar, how will this funding structure affect the fund's long-term sustainability, transparency, and alignment with national goals, such as reducing regional inequality and supporting green innovation? And additionally, how will the government ensure robust governance and accountability while safeguarding against political interference during changes in administration? Thank, Thank you. you very much. And I'll take the fourth question for the gentleman there. And we'll come on to the question. Thanks very much. Um, Michael Lever, I'm a public sector economist. Um, so this is a great uh, opportunity for us in the UK. As Liam pointed out, you know, we are novices in, in the wealth fund space. Um, but as Liam also kind of eloquently pointed out here, um, we don't have the same sort of shed load of cash that um, some of our uh, esteemed colleagues uh, around the world do. So we, we have a problem of scale. Um, we also have uh, a kind of a bit of a tapestry of different institutions like British Business Bank, you know, um, uh, the, there's, all, there's all sorts. Um, we might have to be a bit smart about the scale of the investments and about how we knit that together with industrial strategies. You know, some of the stuff Jim's talking about there, you know, 500 million on hydrogen uh, is great, um, uh, you know, focus on, on Loughborough, but fraction of what the EU are doing in the same space, let's not even talk about what the Americans are doing. So maybe we can talk a bit about challenges around that, nimbleness, things we can learn, do better, that kind of thing. Thank you so much. You know, what I'm going to ask the panel you don't have to answer every, each one of you each of the four questions. Very happy. If you want to, please do so. Or if you want to take a specific question, somebody else Start and deal with it. Can, sure. Um, Is there anything? Um, I mean, I think th these are all brilliant questions that have got to be answered by the time we get to second reading <laughs> of, <laughs> of, the, of the bill in the, in the House of Commons. And I think just because this is quite novel, you know, we would, we would really benefit from a kind of an ongoing conversation about precisely what you think we do need to make sure that we understand before the bill hits um, the House of Commons. Because, you know, one of our role as MPs is to make sure that those questions are answered um, in the debate. I think the, the one thing that I would just pick up is this point about ethical investment frameworks and what indeed the, the money is going into. Because inevitably, a fund like this is going to need to invest in different levels of risk. And the one fund itself shouldn't be investing in that full spectrum of risk. 
there, there may well be a couple of vehicles that it needs to set up, one that is more focused on the riskier end, one that is focused on um, much more stable returns. Um, and you could well imagine that you know, a significant amount of money will go into one of the great needs we've got, which is social housing, for example, co-investing in um, some of the social housing that uh, we need. That's a pretty stable and predictable pathway of return. But equally, there will be many people around the country, not least our mayors, who are saying, look, what we really lack um, is scale-up funding um, and funding that is going to help us bridge the, the valley of death that new businesses um, confront today. And so what I really hope that we can do is use a national fund actually as the fountainhead for a number of regional institutions, very similar to the kind of Sparkassen that we have in Germany, um, that again, blend funding from three or four different sources, but crucially, create an institution locally that brings together the public sector, the private sector, the business community, the banking community, um, as well as crucially the universities. Um, and we, you know, as a country, just lack some of those regional um, uh, bits of infrastructure too. The public investment in many smart castings is actually quite limited. They're able to leverage it up again um, as local banks. But you know, if, if we want to help ensure that the National Wealth Fund closes the economic output gaps in different parts of the country, then it shouldn't just be investing in rock-safe investments. We should be making sure that there is a portion that is investing in new business and helping us fix the regional inequalities that bedevil our country. Thank you very much. Farhan? Yeah, um, the, the, two, the two questions that ring out the most to me, uh, just given the mandate, is, is where, where should we invest? Where, what are the opportunities? And that question is, I think you should ask anywhere. Uh, and, and the answer will be the same, sorry, anywhere you invest is, if you're going to invest in a country, what does that country need? What is it doing, right? Because the only way you can sustainably invest is if you're consistently adding value. So if, if a company comes to Qatar and wants to help us def, you know, fight deforestation, there's not gonna be much for them, right? Um, so the, 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 the way we look at it is we've, we've analyzed it from a national perspective and from a perspective of longevity. So what sectors are we strong in today? Those are manufacturing because of cheap energy prices, logistics because of Qatar Airways and our location, and then tourism because it's untouched. We just never, we never invested in it, right? So if you come in there, you'll find money being spent and you'll have a place where you can add value. Then another thing that I think most investors ignore, which is, which is to their own detriment, is you have enabling clusters. All of these growth clusters, AI, whatever, need enabling clusters. Usually those take form in financial technologies, financial services, healthcare, education. As long as a country is growing, these things need to grow and growth requires investment. Um, and then finally, in, in Qatar, the way we look at it is, if you f have a solution to a problem, we will invest in you because it's, it causes us to be more sustainable. And we win because your solution is actually manufactured or done or created in-house. We don't want your IP. We don't want your cash. We would like the minds to be there so that the spillover effect then spills over to our own children who can then innovate and disrupt and start their own things. Um, finally, before, before I hand over, there's, there was a point made about liquidity and, and cash, and it's a very valid point. We, we were selling oil in rupees at some point. We were selling it by the ton, and we were selling it for 2,000 rupees a ton. In 72, we started selling by the dollar, and even then, um, a lot of that was going to partners that helped us develop. It wasn't until um, the mid-90s where oil prices were high enough that we could actually create our own national champions, uh, many of which His Excellency had himself, uh, QIA, Oridu, Qatar Airways, Al Jazeera, all of these guys. The UK has enough national champions that are large enough and, and present internationally enough that any company that adds value will find value in either servicing them or being serviced by them or partnering with them. So our strategy takes is, is in threefold. One is what do we need in order to sustain our existence? Two is how can we grow our national champions with these foreign partners? And three, if the foreign partner is in Qatar, we need to make sure that they're in Qatar for a long time so that they're making money and they're sustainable. Uh, I'll end with a, a, a line that our CEO likes to say all the time, which I agree with. He says money flows where it's treated best, yes. right? And you'll only treat money well if, you, if, if it's contributing to your own economy, right? Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Maxima? 
Well, look, look, I will address it from different angle. Uh, um, I headed the uh, scene because it is high cost, uh, low return, uh, without the support of any government is going to be uh, a huge risk for any investor to, uh, to get into. So um, in, in during my period, I focused on healthcare, in technology, on AI, where I believe that is the growth, that's the future, and I believe, uh, you know, initially, the, the, the work here has to tap into those uh, areas and sectors. Of course, the financial and the fintech is an area needed to be really looked into very carefully and, and, and uh, targeted well. Otherwise, you will end up, uh, you know, draining the uh, investment that you are putting and uh, ending up in, you know, uh, 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 a lack of, of, of investment in the future. So continuity is an important, strategy is an important, choosing the sectors and the return is an important element, especially in the starting period. Because uh, from 2005 until 2010, it was a growth area for us where we cemented in each area uh, a position and we started building in it. We never ever uh, tried to think of taking the um, dividend out from Q, uh, QIA and uh, pump it into the uh, into the uh, economy because we wanted to keep continue the growing of that uh, fund. I believe uh, in the first decade or so, you should really avoid uh, taking out any dividend coming out from yeah. that uh, you know uh, fund and building uh, building it. And 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 the best case that we all missed is the Norwegian bank, where they initially uh, started it well, and now they are sitting on a, billion, a trillion and a half, trillion and a half, uh, enjoying the return, and uh, with, with really a huge buffer for any uh, uh, economic uh, crisis uh, in the future. So that's my advice, and I, I hope that I added some uh, of the uh, experience I had from QIA. Thank you. Thank you so much for those wise words. Thank you, Ashley. Those are great questions. I take them in reverse order. Uh, so for my course question about the deep pools of finance, there's two ways to look at this. The first of which, the first you say is, I'm not spending any public money today. Uh, Rachel will definitely tell me off. So it's as big as it is, and Rachel will make any future announcements around public spending. But more broadly, I do believe that finance follows returns. And so whilst this is a catalyzing investment, as and in when you're providing direction for, uh, for policy and indeed where this nation's economy is going, and given our, I do think, inherent strengths around education, around our institutions, around the effectiveness of government, albeit, albeit a little bit less so in the last 14 years, there are ways in which actually you can leverage a lot more money if we're doing well. So for example, to like green hydrogen, actually that 500 million is creating the kind of industrial or rather technological advancements and then you're looking at scale up finance I think you are looking at, at different things you could pull in a lot more so I wouldn't just look at the at the initial figure of the 7.3 and say that's all that's coming in um, on Thadwee's question about the uh, aligning with, with leveling up and the rest of it actually this is like a much if you like uh, better way to do so i.e. you have someone or rather you have the fund being allocated in such a way that government is thinking about the ideals like leveling up, um, how to ensure this money is spent correctly, and indeed the audit trail as well. So I think in one sense, I think it's even stronger with this, and it's easier to direct in this direction. And especially with the National Wealth Fund, of course, we are talking about ports, we are talking about things that are helping the coastal regions of our nation, which for the UK in particular, tend to be the outlying areas when it comes to economic activity. So I think it's a very good and a strong case, actually, the UK will both create high returning sectors, but particularly high returning sectors in areas that need them with the same kind of conditions that we'd expect on other uh, on other investment. Um, and then finally, so the non-fossil fuel question, I think, is, as I hope has been answered. Dan, on the investor question, annoyingly, I did ask this question two weeks ago, as in for my own area, because I also want the cash. And I know the answer, well, I got the answer, and I don't know it today. So come back to me or email my office and I'll get it back to you. I think it's the British Business Bank or one of the financing arms by current board. Is it? Oh, brilliant. It's the British Business Bank. 
Uh, let's check. But um, do I'm more than happy to provide that answer basically uh, next week, or you know, go to the treasury. But it is, it is should be available publicly, basically. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Jeevan. Alan. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I, I, and I think these reforms are predicated on the, the fact that we know we need to make changes to the British Business Bank and the UK National Infrastructure Bank. So I think you'll find both of them as places to go. Um, uh, in a very British way, we have something similar to what we're trying to do. We just don't talk about it. We have a development finance institution yeah. called British International Investment with a portfolio of about £7 billion, pounds, $7 billion of investment in 2020. Uh, I saw them in India. The, the challenge for me with them was their risk appetite. So so um, they were very happy to put half a billion pounds into an EV transition plan with Mahindra, one of India's most successful car businesses. Um, I, I think for us it will be what is our appetite as we develop this to, to not just be backing the things that we're going to get uh, uh, institutional or, or investment anyway. Um, and, and I think the other thing that certainly I've found is a, a lot of this is about the project and the relationships. Um, so we, we have already seen in Scotland significant uh, success in attracting <coughs> Ontario uh, teachers' pension plans, Canadian pension plans, into partnerships, long-term partnerships, infrastructure investment with SSE and others in the energy sector. Hopefully we'll, we'll be seeing the right projects for your uh, uh, business to invest in. And also the relationships. And on that, Rachel was the first Chancellor in 10 years to go to Canada to meet these pension funds only recently. So we, that's why we know we are serious. We want to build these relationships and make sure that people have confidence in the uh, ministers and officials that they're, that they're dealing with. Well, thank you so much for that. We have about seven minutes left. So any more, please? Anyone Can else? Got any questions, Excuse comments, me. observations? Oh, would you like to? I have to. Oh, you could again. Okay, that's thank fine. you. Can oh, you yeah. oh, okay. Right. Well, thank, thank you. Can you. Can you. Thank you, guys. I have a train to catch, so you know uh, I would love to continue. But thank you so much. Happy days. Can you talk to them? Yeah. I'm sorry, I was just. No, no. What I was saying. The ambassador is leaving. I said we've got about seven minutes, and if anybody's got any questions, comments, observations they want to make, please do so. Oh, you want to speak to the ambassador? Okay. Okay, right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, coming to today's event. And can I thank my uh, panelists, uh, the wonderful ambassador, who I know is heading to Gay's train, Fahad from the University of... Uh, oh, you're still here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Liam Byrne and Jeevan. But well, there's, you know, there's three very distinguished people here, so anyone want any further questions? We've got five minutes. Wouldn't want to waste it. Uh, no? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, you mentioned that the average... Hi, it has going. So you, uh, you mentioned that the average return uh, on investment uh, for other sovereign wealth funds was around 8%. Has the British government done any forecasting on what they expect to get over? And uh, the other gentleman mentioned that um, it's a good idea to wait 10 years before you withdraw a dividend. So it seems a very much a long-term plan. Uh, and, and as you can probably see that the British public can be quite impatient with certain things. So what are we expecting in terms of a return? And when are we looking to start withdrawing a dividend? Okay. Thank you. Any other? Yeah. I think basically, look, the, the short answer is they're both questions to be determined um, by the Treasury in the future, or uh, if it is DBT doing the forecasting. I Honestly, that's, that's a question for them. But in terms of the dividend in particular, I'd say there's also... The return is not just the fact that you're making investments, you withdraw cash. The other return, of course, is the economic activity. So I think, as has been mentioned, Norway has been sitting on a huge pile of, of money that's gaining that return. Uh, the question is also kind of uh, where those investments are being made. So actually, I wouldn't just think about the return in terms of uh, cash coming out of the investments. I'd also think about it in terms of the jobs being created, the investments being made, the technological advancement, the changing structure of economic activity. More broadly... What the kind of investments we're talking about in the National Wealth Fund do tend to sit at the technological frontier. So whilst those returns can end up being quite high, I think they'll also be, you know, there's a case they say they could be underestimated. I think particularly about solar, for example, you know, 15, 20 years ago, solar was, I think, seven to eight times more expensive than natural gas. It's now 50 to 75 percent cheaper, in part because of the investments being made. It's quite difficult, and economists are awful at being able to forecast and predict the effects of human ingenuity. And if we did know that, then we all would have invested in Tesla a decade ago and in NVIDIA five years ago. And I suspect we didn't because, you know, no one here is like, uh, well, 
I won't go into that. But anyway, <laughs> um, you know, we don't we don't invest as MPs. Let me put it that way. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Would you like to? Say sure. Um, well, I I I understand where I am and 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 the crowd and and, but the way we see it is. The current constituency has nothing to do with the results of a national wealth fund, nor does it have anything to do with our investments, because what you're trying to do is create a sustainable economic environment such that the next generation can benefit from it, right? And then it's on them to do that for the generation thereafter. The way that looks in the future is probably going to be different. It might be the same as today. Um, there is an impatience, but I don't think it's unique to, to British people or, or, or anyone. I, I just think that Anyways, our approach was, this isn't for us, right? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Liam? I just have a, a couple of bits of the research that we, we came across for the book and some of the polling that we did um, for the book. So it's obviously, it, 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 the, the fastest way to help build these funds, if you don't have the blessings of natural resources, is to use tax revenues. And, and there's a, and I can, I, you know, I can say all of this as a, as, as a backbencher, <laughs> not a frontbencher, you know. And so people like me will be making the argument that, look, if you look at what's happened to the UK economy over the last 15 years, we've just put in a trillion pounds of quantitative easing. That's held interest rates down by about 1%. If you were lucky enough to hold a lot of assets, your wealth has actually multiplied significantly. In fact, the top 1% in the, our country has increased their wealth by about 31 times everybody else. But, you know, quantitative easing isn't free. It's actually got a fiscal cost of about 104 billion. <laughs> so there is a strong case for just saying to people like Rishi Sunak, who earns two million a year, but pays 23% tax. Actually, Mr. Sunak, you and, and others, who have enjoyed a big investment windfall over the last few years, you may just need to be paying a little bit more tax. Now, when you, when, when you rehearse this argument with the public, they can buy into it, but the one big worry they've got is waste and the money getting wasted. But if you then say, look, we're going to create something that basically looks and feels like the National Trust, and we're going to put the money into there to grow and accumulate and help your grandchildren, then actually there is a politics there that you can win. Now, we then did some polling to say, right, what, what old British public would you like to do with the dividends? And, you know, and cards on the table, there is a challenge here because actually the most popular answer for the dividends is to increase pensions. So you've got to win an argument that creating these intergenerational wealth transfer funds is something that does actually need to be put into the service of helping young people who now face assets that are much more expensive compared to their wages. We do need to help them. Back in the 1970s, you know, when I was born in the holy town of Warrington, the, 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 the national wealth of the country was about three times national wages. Now the national wealth of the country is 10 times national wages. So what, what does that mean? It means that assets are just far more expensive compared to what you earn these days than they were back in the 1970s. And that means that young people have just got a much harder gig in trying to build assets of their own. Now, we, we could just let them get on with it, but this is not a problem that's going to fix itself. And so as a country, we've got some big decisions to confront about how we help Gen Z, that extraordinary generation, um, and maybe their kind of younger uh, brothers and sisters, how, how are we going to help them build the wealth that will give them the security, that will safeguard the freedoms and opportunities that they should enjoy this century? Thank you so much for that, Liam. And Alan? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I missed the question. Yeah, okay. Well, I... I was going to say, I don't know about yourselves, but I found the discussion incredibly fascinating. I'm not somebody who was so well in tuned about investments and funding, but I've learned a lot. Uh, and I think it seemed like a good project that we've started. And I'm sure that it will go from uh, you know, strength to strength. So I'd like everyone, if we can, thank our panellists in our usual traditional way for their contribution and discussion. <laughs>